Hi again, everybody. I'm Steve Pakin at the Aviation Hangar at Canador College in North Bay, Ontario. We've just done an hour on television, and now we've flipped over to our online component at theagenda.tvo.org. We've been talking about how North Bay can diversify its economy going forward, what it's doing, some of the challenges it has, some of the solutions it's come up with, and now we wanted to add five voices uh, to a second component in our discussion today, some of these people with hands-on experience on how to diversify the economy of Northern Ontario, and let's introduce you to them right now. David Thompson is at the left end of that shot. He is with the Near North District School Board. Beside him, Wendy Graham, who represents My Health, that's spelled M-I, H-E-A-L-T-H. -E Beside her, Tracy marsh Fiore, who is in charge of ICAMP at Canador College. Then David Robinson, who comes to us from Laurentian University in Sudbury. And Jennifer McNutt-Bywater, who runs something called Vested Interest. And I know our North Bay audience wants to welcome this group to our stage tonight. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk to you folks up here for a little bit and then go into the audience and get some questions for you as well. But Jennifer, why don't you get us started? What's vested interest? Well, vested interest is um, uh, my husband and I were um, entrepreneurs. On, we are entrepreneurs and we started our business 20 years ago. Um, we traveled to, mostly to Southeast Asia and import uh, home decor and furniture, so silver jewelry, accessories, and import it into North Bay. So we have a, a retail um, face with vested interest and we also have a wholesale division called Buckstone Inc and we wholesale across Canada and we wholesale to 1500 stores across the country from Vancouver Island straight through to uh, Newfoundland. Huh. And you're running out of North Bay, Ontario. We, uh, yes, well, calendar now. We've calendar, just opened, okay. yes, we were in North Bay up until a month ago and uh, we've relocated to Calendar, Ontario, which is eight minutes from North Bay. And how's it going? It, it's been going fantastic. We're uh, very happy with our new location. We had uh, an unfortunate incident a couple of years ago with a fire, so uh, we're very happy with our with our relocation. And, uh, and I just understand that your your business in North Bay burned down. Yes, it did. How many years ago? Uh, two and a half years ago, and we are just um, sort of up and running into our new location. So it was a very devastating occurrence, obviously, for our business, but also for the community because um, we're a destination store here, and uh, we're an anchor store for the downtown. So it was very devastating for for everyone involved. So, um, But we're very fortunate because we have such great local um, support, and uh, everybody has been behind us. So um, we're very happy that we're you know, up and running and uh, back we're, on your feet. we're back on our feet, yes. Uh, where did the interest in goods from halfway around the world come from in the first place? Basically, uh, both my husband and I had a great love of travel, world travel, and uh, had traveled quite significantly across around the world before meeting one another. And uh, we wanted to um, start a business that allowed us to continue to travel and to create a lifestyle for ourselves and eventually for our family. And um, so we, we came upon the, the idea of starting this business. We became North Bay's very first street vendors. Our first product were actually sandals made out of recycled rubber tires from South Africa. And uh, we became North Bay's first street vendors. And we've expanded that business to uh, what we currently are, um, wholesaling to all of those stores across Canada. Now, I assume at some point, at the beginning of this venture, people came to you and said, this is a dumb idea, this is never going to work. We, yes? we actually, uh, we started our business 20 years ago in Calendar, and we did have those comments, you will, what, are you, what are you thinking, you'll never be able to succeed in Calendar. And uh, of course, we, we were able to prove them wrong. We expanded so um, quickly that we did move to North Bay up until the fire, and we had a beautiful, beautiful heritage building there, and uh, expanded and, and grew our business, um, stuck to what we really, truly believed. And, and you know, if you listen to the naysayers, um, as an entrepreneur, then you'll never really get anywhere. So you really have to, to believe in yourself and, and believe in what you're doing and things will, will work out. Because again, when we started having children 13 years ago, people would say, oh my, what are you going to do now? You're going to have to find another job. You can, surely you can't succeed in your business with children. Well, into the backpack they went and they've been traveling with us since they were six months old. So they, they too are very well traveled and, um, and, and that is, is uh, showing up in, in in, in 
efforts that they're doing as well in their short lives too. So, um, you know, I think as an entrepreneur, you just have to really believe in what it is you're doing and stick to what you believe to be uh, what, you, what you're able to do because I think here in the north especially because you have the support of the community uh, you can do anything. So you started small and now it's a private company you don't have to tell me if you don't want to but your revenues today are what? Oh, geez, that's my husband's division. <laughs> he always says, uh, I'm the style and he's the number. So, um, but I, I would say we are a, a successful company and we employ um, about 15, 15 people now. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> David Thompson, tell us what the Near North School Board is. Well, we're an English public school. Uh, we have 17,000 kilometers that we cover, 41 schools from Perry Sound to Mattawa to Sturgeon Falls. Uh, we have 10,000 students, and as your main panel alluded to, we have a declining enrollment issue. Uh, like most Northern Ontario school boards, a recent CBC study came out said that between 30 and 50 percent of all school boards in Northern Ontario uh, have that much vacancy in their schools. And so we have a, a huge issue. Uh, we need to put brains in seats. And we have to do some out-of-the-box thinking. That's funny. Most people talk about putting bums in seats. No. Nope. <laughs> brains are more important. Brains in seats. Like that. Like that. Okay. And you're you can use that again if you want. <laughs> you're, you're the public school board as opposed to the publicly funded separate school board. Yes, and that's a whole different show, Steve. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be. Why? Do you have a thing about that? Well, the issue of one school board, and this is the challenge of Northern Ontario, is we're, it is a business. Uh, education is a business. We're competing for a narrowing segment of students. And so the Near North has to think outside the box and, and look beyond our borders. And we've got programs like our robotics. We talk, the panel earlier talked about robotics. While well, we have Team 1305 who have gone to the World Championships 11 years in a row, we are now introducing International Baccalaureate. So these are the issues that we are bringing to North Bay because we have to compete with everyone else. Do you think there's enough money in the education system today to fund a publicly funded public school system and a publicly funded Catholic school system. You're asking me personally? I am. Yeah, no, there isn't. I think that uh, <laughs> consolidation is, uh, I teach on the college side, and so I see both sides of the education fence. I couldn't tell my students if they went to the English or Catholic or French, so I think that that's the, the, the merit of one school board is, and so to answer your question, uh, I think we can save between 1.2 and 1.7 billion dollars annually by having one school board. Annually? Annually. How? Uh, consolidation of schools. We've got schools right across from each other that are 40% you know, vacant. So um, just consolidating of schools is an issue. And uh, as a board, we're going through a consolidation of schools, which is a very emotional, especially in rural Ontario, where we're looking at closing a school of 53 students. That's the heart of their community. So these are the issues that we're dealing with in Northern Ontario. You do know there is an absolutely toxic mix between politics, education, and religion, right? Is it really? Yes. Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. You might want to ask Vic Fidelli about that. I think something happened to his party in 2007 yeah, on actually, that score. Yeah, actually, I had the same conversation with John Tory, so yes. Yeah. Um, so the question is, okay, that's your, that's your idea for making education better and saving money. Can that be done? Well, we have no control over that. The, the political will is there. Um, but we're talking about Northern Ontario initiatives and, and what the Near North District School Board is doing is we can't control those things. Okay, but one thing. Sorry, finish yeah, up. But we, we can control other things as pro providing great programming for our students, and that's what attracts students. And that's what I wanted to pick up on. One thing you can control is destination education. Yes. Tell us what that is. It's a unique concept. Uh, education has been very prevalent in North Bay for over 100 years with the Teachers College. Uh, what we're doing is creating a seamless pipeline from JK to 15. Uh, we have now entered an agreement with uh, Nipissing University where it's Chippewa Secondary. Our grade 12 students can take two credits if they get their 80% and pass that course. They get those two credits at Nipissing University. Those are automatically enrolled and it's saving parents so that you don't have to pay the tuition fee. What we're looking at with Nipissing is expanding it to five credits, to, so basically one semester. Now we're marketing it to the world. So a parent in China or India says, you mean I can send my child to Chippewa Secondary School in North Bay, grade 12, to get a grade 12 diploma, get five credits to Nipissing University, automatic enrollment to a Canadian university for a certain amount of dollars. Well, why wouldn't they? It's a seamless, seamless education pipeline, but it also helps us put brains in seats, but it helps Nipissing University put brains in seats as well. So it's not just a, a declining enrollment for us, but it's for 
post-secondary education. So it's that partnership in education. Is there something about this community in particular that makes it a good fit for destination education? Well, you had a guest on earlier from the Multicultural Centre. You know, this is a great community for immigrants. Uh, they're very welcoming. Nipissing University and, and Canada College are exemplifying that. I remember when I was growing up, we had one black family and one Chinese family, and that was in the early 70s. And that has changed now, and that means that North Bay is progressing. And so that's why you know, we have all these international companies that are bringing foreign workers or foreign people here. So North Bay is a, is a great candidate for that. Don't misunderstand. I'm, I'm not saying this to be critical, but it, it's still a 92% white city, right? It's changed, though, since I was, uh, I was in you know, elementary school. <laughs> More multicultural. Absolutely. Than it was. Yes. Okay. David, thank you for that. Uh, Wendy, what's my health? My health is a disruptive healthcare technology that I think is the way healthcare will move in the future. What it allows, um, actually, is a patient to be able to carry all their medical records on a smartphone and have the interoperability to carry with them anywhere in the world every bit of information they need. And in addition to that, they would be able to Skype their family physician or their specialist to have an online anywhere in the world opportunity for uh, uh, an assessment that would be meeting certain standards. They also can call uh, through the My Health text um, for an appointment, uh, answer a question, order a medication with a provider that's managing their care. So is this an app? It is a service modality. It's accessible through the internet or through all uh, modalities of phone, Samsung to Apple, uh, all tablets as well. So it, it's not limited by any means in terms of the technology through which it's accessed. Developed here? Uh, I would have to say its origins uh, were very bravely thought through uh, with the U.S. military in a research project called TACTRA. Uh, and in my position as an assistant professor at Nipissing, uh, sorry, at the Northern Ontario Medical School, I was able to partake in that research project. And they were managing soldiers in dire situations from San Antonio, Texas in war zones. So I saw how they managed stress, post-traumatic stress, diabetes, and it's been adapted to, for the Canadian healthcare system. So that's obviously one particular type of client who would use this. Who else would use this? Uh, there's been uh, a great variety. We thought it would be specific for chronic disease because, as you know, 6% of healthcare costs actually are attributed to chronic disease and conditions in the emergency rooms. But in fact, all comers, all people took it. It's about 60 40 women. Uh, over the men because they manage the babies and they manage the grandparents and they shop for two. Uh, but we have uh, users as older uh, as 91 and as young as 14 uh, because they're able to manage their records. And I think the uptake has been uh, paid for us because people are very comfortable doing online banking and they actually do their online banking and then they think of a question they want to ask the office, an appointment or a change of medication and they message the office securely after they've done their online banking. Skype for the grandparents because they Skype Skype the grandchildren, has really enabled people to be very positive about the concept of not leaving the workplace. And uh, you'll see, I think, with the new Ontario Medical Association agreement, physicians being paid or bonused and aligning incentives for efficiencies in health care. So this is a very exciting area. And in addition to that, there are all kinds of devices or commodities that patients can put on their skin and will be able to measure their pulse uh, there are electrolytes in the future, uh, so easily with a movable skin patch, much the way you're seeing Apple develop today. Now, it's an entrepreneurial innovation, but is anybody making any money off it? Well, Facebook was pre-revenue for some time, uh, and I think in the digital healthcare space, this is a transformative, disruptive technology. In Canada, we have a culture where we wait for an appointment, we wait in the emergency room, we wait at the doctor's office, and what I'm hoping this will do is leapfrog forward the inefficiencies uh, to allow uh, the system to save the monies that we need to do. In healthcare in the U.S., it's a trillion dollar subject matter, and we are tied very carefully and very uh, uh, proudly to the U.S. and I think if we help the U.S. and other countries solve some of the inefficiencies and operational difficulties um, as the U.S. military pioneered, I think there'll be some terrific revolution. Why do you call it disruptive? Because it's not the way we're used to doing things. Um, we have a very set role and regulatory pattern that's rigid in healthcare. And if our policies um, were easy to sort out with respect to the providers, uh, payment and government issues and the regulation issues, uh, it would have been done much faster. But in fact, there are many silos of turfs in healthcare and one does not want to give up their regulatory rights and responsibilities to share and be cooperative. So it's a tough legal battle. 
And last question, how can you spell my health, M-I, Because it health. stands for Mission Impossible in health <laughs> Okay. I thought it was like iPhone or iPad Well, you can do that too. That too, okay. <laughs> mission Impossible. Do you feel like you're on an impossible mission right now, getting this thing? Uh, well, I'm very uh, aware of the entrepreneurial. Don't lose sight of your focus. Don't lose sight of what you believe is possible. And while all the naysayers say it's not, you don't stop. And we've had some tremendous support from Microsoft now internationally and InterSystems, who is the business of healthcare interoperability. They actually integrate 70% of uh, the state of New York, which is 11 million citizens. So in the future, you will be able to walk in with a consumer-facing app that you can download, as we do, and that will create a digital record of everything that's happened to you in the healthcare system that's dynamic and will be we continue to add it to as data comes on board. I think North Bay is the ideal place to begin to think internationally with the types of data cloud storage that would be needed to support this initiative globally. Speaking of the cloud, you got a you got a big pit somewhere in the middle of the city that Vic Fidelli was telling us about. You could always do some of the storage down there. Well, I was born here, and my father was a mining engineer and involved in mining, as are my brothers. And I I often thought about the resources that we were so, so short of, but particularly in healthcare. And we set a precedent actually with the malaria case that very tragically passed in the emergency room here because he had come back from uh, an infested area of Africa with malaria. And we did not do a thick film smear, but you don't think of these things. But every community is global. Every community has international experiences that change them forever. So I thought that this would address uh, many of the very excellent engineers that do mining around the world, and it would assist in uh, Medivac and different things that we can put our records on, and they will have them. Nobody goes on a diet today without <laughs> their weigh scale or their, or their pedometer in their hand on their phone. And that's the future of healthcare. This is the next step. This is the next step. Got it, okay. Tracy, you were telling us during the uh, television broadcast about um, the thing that you're involved in here, ICAMP, and what do you think all of these stories tell us about innovation in this part of the province today? I think what it tells us is, is how uh, resilient and how forward thinking our, our companies are here in North Bay in this, uh, you know, what I would say would be a small city compared to some of the rest throughout Ontario. And that it's really, um, what really hits home is that we have in each one of us that ability to, to do the innovation piece. And so as a community, as a community college, as a university, in, in all um, sectors across the board is how do we support each other in moving that innovation forward and so the Innovation Center for Advanced Manufacturing and Production is exactly that where they can have a concept they can have um, a prototype and a design and and anything that we can do to assist them to help um, help grow their company and help make them a stronger company is truly what what we're set up to do. David Robinson is it harder or easier to push innovation forward here? Well, it's pretty impressive what you're saying. It mustn't be too much harder than the rest of the world. I think that times have changed. This is, in terms of innovation, access to information, access to capital, and so on, you're not out of the loop in a place like North Bay. You were even 25 years ago. Okay, we're going into this audience right now, and I think, ma'am, you said oh, you had I a question. Right. Do you want to start us off here? Um, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> well... <coughs> Um, Do you want to stand up, I, first of all, just so we can see you a little better? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, a long time ago, um, when the roads weren't paved north of here, we took the train, slept overnight to visit my grandparents in Hamilton. And um, so fast forward, I now travel with the students on the Greyhound. Students from the medical school in Sudbury, probably. They could be University of Laurentian, Ottawa. Just explain to people um, why you take the bus now instead of the train. We don't have the train. I know you know that and we know that, but a lot of people watching us may right. not know that. So. so if you guys wanted to just pop over to Sudbury, there was one, there's a bus at 10 to 5 tomorrow morning. And then if you didn't want to come home at lunchtime, there's one at midnight coming back. And I had heard that the Ontario Northland, we have a beautiful station here, if you haven't seen it, and I heard that they had offered to take over the 
bus transportation. And for some political reason, um, that wasn't possible. It isn't lawful or there's you know a what? reason. And that was my question. Can I, and, and actually, rather than going to somebody up here, Vic, can I get you on this? Because you've been raising, thank you for the question, Matt. You've been raising questions, I know, in the legislature about this. And I suspect if anybody in the room knows the status of trying to get ONTC back in business, it's you. What's the latest? Well, my answer, sadly, might be a little bit more political than you'd like. I think what we've seen is a uh, government about, about two years ago that decided to, made an announcement they were going to divest Ontario Northland. And that includes things like the Polar Bear Express, the uh, freight rail, uh, telecommunications, uh, passenger, uh, bus passenger, and uh, marine division. So they wanted to divest it and save $265 million a year. Um, we brought the Auditor General in. The Auditor General said, no, there's a flag on the play. You will not save $265 million. In fact, to sell all this will cost $820 million. And at that moment, we knew they would backtrack. Sadly, uh, the the, free, or the passenger rail has been cancelled and it will be extremely difficult now to bring that back here into uh, northern Ontario uh, and just recently the telecommunications division has been sold and so that too is a, a very unfortunate uh, 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 transaction considering it was one of the few divisions that actually was a profitable division so we have uh, the motor coach that uh, your guest was speaking about. We have the beautiful and scenic uh, Polar Bear Express passenger train that takes you from Cochrane to Moosonee. And we have uh, uh, the rail division, rail refurbishment, and a freight rail. Those are the divisions that okay. were, were left. But the province doesn't have any money left. So my hunch is that even if you were in power right now, you wouldn't be spending a <laughs> billion dollars to fix the tracks and do what it takes to keep it in business. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is to at least consult with the people throughout Northern Ontario and the stakeholders and determine what is it that you really need? What are we trying to achieve? Is it passenger service? Is it the rail freight? Uh, do we need that telecommunications any further? You know, it's our link to the, we believe uh, that it's our link to the ring of fire from a freight perspective. Um, so we really need to at least uh, have uh, uh, stakeholder meetings and, and chat with the members of the public to find out what can we, what can we uh, have, what can we offer you that will best meet all of the needs of all of the people at a price, I think, that Ontario can afford. Is it possible that its day is done and buses are just going to have to be the way it's going to be? Well, you know, when you have uh, airlines now that will fly you from Timmins to Toronto for $121 in about 45 minutes and you have the train that would be uh, about the same price but 11 hours you know things have changed uh, uh, in society and when you have Thunder Bay to Toronto where you can also travel for 120 bucks uh, you know there's just a difference today that we need to take all of these uh, uh, new uh, uh, processes into account gotcha okay thank you for that anybody up there want to add anything on that or have we covered it what do we think? We're good? Okay. Who else has got a question here? Anybody? Yes, right here, sir. Let me come around to you. I'm going to sneak in here. Forgive my back. Yes, you wanted to say. I've I left North Bay. I went to Toronto for 15 years. I came back, started the business over here, and I really enjoy the fact that I don't have to drive two hours to go to work, <laughs> and I can be, somebody in North Bay can be leaving work and be at the cottage within 15 minutes. Try to beat that in Toronto. By the time you get your car, I'm at home. <laughs> no, you're right. What's, what's the business that brought you back? Plastic injection molding. I was uh, working for Ontario Hydro, and I was hunting with a fellow from uh, Toronto, and he showed me, he brought me over there for a visit to see a lights-out manufacturing system, and I said, wow, I can do that here in North Bay. Are you still doing it? Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so business is good. Business is good. And uh, we... <laughs> <laughs> we ship our products all over the world, and I just had a request for a, a, a nice, large, multi-hundred thousand dollar order from Antofagasta in Chile. And hmm. now, if I get that, I might lose a little bit of weight. <laughs> how does, tell me, how does this company in Chile that you're doing business with, how do they even know that you exist? I went for a coffee in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas at a mining show, and we got to meet some uh, right. mining distributors out of uh, Palestine, Texas, and huh. they sell my products. Huh. 
I thought what happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> yes, no. Okay. All right. Thank you for that story. That's great. Who's next? Okay. At the back here. At the back here. Thank you for standing up. Okay. You wanted to say. Uh, I did have a, a comment and a question, and the sure. comment was to uh, Mr. Thompson as to the, the, the one school board as a, as a Francophone and as a Francophone teacher. Uh, an amalgamation on linguistic terms would definitely cause a kerfuffle, to say the least. Uh, and I do find it interesting that in an hour-long conversation about uh, the entirety of Northern Ontario and, and an economic develop, development standpoint, every community has been spoken about except the Francophone community. And my question to that effect, mm -hmm. uh, especially when we're in a town where that does have the largest uh, Francophone carnival outside of La Ville de Québec. What's it called? Uh, Le Carnaval des Compagnons, okay. from the local uh, Francophone community center here. Uh, my question would be for the gentleman uh, from Laurentian University, wondering if there's any data to support the Northern Ontario linguistic advantage of the amount of bilingual francophones that are here that do add to the sellability of uh, commerce and, uh, and investment in the North, if there's anything to sustain that argument, because it is what we tell uh, students and uh, Mr. Thompson in uh, in Chippewa's immersion program, they, they 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 say it in the francophone systems. We say it the same thing. Uh, to be bilingual is to have that extra advantage and that extra edge. Sure. So I'm very curious as to for the Northern Ontario's economic development, if that's a point where there's data to really sustain that argument. Let's just, David, just before you answer, let's understand the numbers. I think we mentioned earlier that 92 percent of the people who live in North Bay are white. Is it 75 Anglo and 15 Franco? Does that sound about right? See, the only numbers I have on a Francophone basis do include uh, from Sturgeon all the way to Astelville, Bonfield, okay. Cobay, Calendar, the, the general. Uh, that would be 25%. 25% Francophone? Of, pe of people uh, a, a Francophone or at least able to carry a, a conversation <coughs> en français. Yeah. Okay. David Robinson, you want to speak to his issue? I've never looked at those numbers that might demonstrate an economic advantage, it's pretty commonly held and I tend to believe it myself. Certainly students who are bilingual have advantages for some kinds of employment, particularly public sector employment. And the only other example that jumps to my mind is the call centers where it's, a, it's definitely an advantage in Canada. We don't have a, a seamless transition to international business just to connect with the discussion about the school system, where it would be something of an advantage. We can't take advantage of that systematically yet. David Thompson, could you speak to the question of whether or not the French language would be endangered if you went to the unified school board system that you talked about earlier? Well, you just have to look at the province of Quebec and uh, Newfoundland, most Catholic and French-speaking provinces in, in the Confederation. They've done it, so um, why aren't we looking at it? We've had schools in Mattawa and Sturgeon Falls where we've joint schools, and it's worked. Unfortunately, uh, in Mattawa, they gave money to a, a new school for the Francophone, and so it split it up. So it has worked in the past. And so if the, those two provinces in Canada can make it work, why can't we? Um, to also add, and this is a conversation I was having with Chief Coochie, one of the things that we're also looking at adding is uh, Ojibwe as a, a third language. We're talking about other languages and trying to compete with the world. Uh, the First Nations demographics is the fastest growing one in Canada. And so we recognize that. We live in their territory. Why aren't we teaching that in our schools as well? So it's not just French, English, but it's other languages. And by introducing international baccalaureate, maybe it's Spanish, because Spanish is probably the second most used uh, language in business. So it, it, why can't we look at it all? I guess I should come back at you and say, Quebec had it the same way we did for 150 years where they were funding two parallel systems and then they in their wisdom decided not to do that anymore. I'm not sure it's been problem free the way David has described it, but yeah, they're a, doing it. That's a very utopic way of looking at the idea. Okay. Uh, I, I can speak to the fact that uh, Quebec would have made their choices and I mean I'm born and, born and raised, well raised as of the age of seven from North Bay so I can't speak to the Quebecois condition. Uh, <laughs> Where are you from I, originally? Uh, I was born in Sturgeon Okay. and uh, we moved here when I was seven but the idea for me would just be to, to compare the Quebec system to the rest of uh, North America uh, without taking into account the idea of you're talking about a language and a culture trying to preserve itself in an incredible position of cultural minority. Yep. 
And if that, argu if that element isn't part of the argument, then it's not a complete argument, or it's not a complete discussion anyways. And I'm not hearing that element in what Mr. Thompson is saying, but I, that's not necessarily an argument that is, is his to make, He's here from an English public school board. But are you, are you convinced the French language would be endangered if we went to a unified school board system in Ontario? 100 percent. 100 percent. And the reason I know this is because not 100 years ago, there was a law in this province banning all Francophone education altogether. So there have been, uh, there have been uh, struggles and, uh, and achievements made uh, when they passed uh, 60, uh, Bill 60 in, uh, uh, in 1997 when they established the four uh, school board model, uh, one of the biggest accomplishments from a Francophone perspective was the fact that Francophones got to govern Francophone education for the very first time. And that is something that it took, it was an amazing struggle and a great accomplishment. And, and you want to hang on to that? It's not, you want to talk about divi the dividing lines between religion and non-religion, not fully knowing the entirety of the constitutional arguments behind that. That's a conversation that could possibly happen, although maybe not if you're running for any kind of political office. Okay. Uh, but from a language perspective, uh, yeah, I, I, I would, that's, that would be a difficult conversation to have without keeping in mind that there is a minority uh, cultural aspect to keep in, to keep okay. in mind. Okay, I'm going to get some other people Absolutely. in if you don't mind. But, but uh, merci thanks. for coming to uh, North and Bay. And merci for making the point, and we feel very uh, bienvenue ici. <laughs> very, wel <laughs> very welcome. My French is awful, unfortunately. Uh, who else? <laughs> Who's uh, got it? Yes, please, right down here. Oh, I know you. Hi. Do, have you got a nomination date yet? This is more than you want to know, but <laughs> this is Elise, and she's seeking the Liberal nomination in Sudbury. Yeah. But the Liberal Party has not called the nomination date yet, despite the fact that Elise and what's the other guy? Andrew Olivier. Andrew Olivier are vying for the nomination there. But there's been no date called yet. Anyway, Correct. and you must have a good sense of humor to be this patient. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even um, Rick Bartolucci the other day said it was a Keystone heard, Cops running the show, eh? Yes, I he heard. He wasn't oh, too pleased Friday, about it. Yeah. Anyway, enough but, politics. Um, you wanted to ask. Yeah, so my, my question is actually, um, we talked about originally the different percentages of people and there were a fair number of people in retail and we're talking about manufacturing. So um, obviously, where the general perception is that manufacturing have better paying jobs and so it would be great to transition as many people have, have spoken to. Um, but with the recent agreements, international free trade agreement with uh, Europe and pending signing with uh, Korea and possibly China, I was wondering how that may affect uh, manufacturing in the north. Who wants in on that? <laughs> It puts more pressure on manufacturing and tends to be an advantage for the resource industries and for the industries particularly that are producing for the mining companies. The mining supply sector will have an advantage, but we're always, as manufacturers, under pressure from the lower wage, high volume countries now. Is there much reshoring going on in Northern Ontario? Reshoring? Well, you know how we lost a lot of business because it went offshore? Some of it's coming back called reshoring. Much of that happening up here? I, I don't know of any numbers on that. Yeah. The, there's some anecdotes. Tracy? I would, I would echo with David as well. I think what we're, we're starting to see is, is that uh, the companies are um, really trying to latch on to those opportunities as they arise. And, you know, again, looking for, the, for whatever competitive advantage that they might be able to, to get um, by grabbing onto those opportunities. How's retail doing? Retail, well, a season, you know, can be very seasonal, um, mm -hmm. particularly here in the north. And, um, you know, and, it, and again, it's one of those sectors that uh, has its up and ups and downs, but we rely on the retail sector heavily here in the north. So, you know, again, anything we can do to support our entrepreneurs and our, from the retail side um, is, again, as a community, what we have to look at. Jennifer, doing. how does it look? Retailing in general. Retail in general, it's interesting because uh, we do have that, um, the perspective across the country and uh, we're able to, uh, for our own business anyway, we're able to take, it, take advantage of the fact that if uh, Western Canada is having a, a great uh, banner year and maybe Eastern Canada is less so, we can support the ones that uh, need us most and, and, and also be there for the ones that uh, require our, our products. So, um, but from a, a local perspective here in North Bay, um, we've always seemed to be just steady Eddie. 
And uh, we don't have those great peaks and valleys. That's a good uh, thing, eh? I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think as, a, as an entrepreneurial retail business, we always have to be innovative and thinking outside of the box and always adding value. And, and um, it, we can't wait to see what the market is, is, is waiting for. We have to be prepared to supply what we... What, we have to forecast very, very cleverly. And... Um, and, and that's what, where we, we have moved ourselves into uh, food and gourmet food and gluten food and so on, which is a complete um, takeoff from where we started. But, you know, we have to be ahead of the curve. Sure. Let's get one more question in before the day is done. Yes, sir. I um, have to disagree with something that an earlier panelist said, and I'm pleased to say it wasn't with my boss, President Burton. <laughs> um, you work I, here at Canada. Yes, I do. Okay. And I'm just um, looking at the, the group that's in front of us in terms of their question, uh, their their roles and responsibilities. And each of them has gone outside of the community and looked to the global marketplace for innovation. And I'm wondering if they could share and speak to what led them to that um, and to not just curl up and die and assume that because we're Northerners, everything is going to be happening in the South. Wendy, why didn't you curl up and die? <laughs> <laughs> I was totally overwhelmed by what the San Antonio team was doing in Medicare, supporting their soldiers uh, digitally and at great distances. And with respect to Korea, I would say maybe not, not real retail, but healthcare offers significant business opportunities. And we met in the U.S., unfortunately, with Korea, uh, even though there was a delegation in Toronto, and they have the fastest growing uh, population of aging people looking for tremendous operational efficiencies to keep people at home as grandparents and great-grandparents. So I think there's a great deal we can learn from these people. Uh, I think there's a great deal we can learn from many other uh, cultures and industries. And unless we literally get out of our, our homes and travel with our children uh, and look at different healthcare systems or different ways of doing things, uh, you, you just you just won't get that opportunity to think outside the box. It's great to come back here because we're resource depleted. We, are very, we have very, very few resources. So that uh, creates different ways, uh, basically re-engineering uh, things and subject matters that, that has, I think, made Northern Ontario innovators. We should probably give the last word today to somebody who uh, has been our host here at Canador. Why haven't you curled up and died? <laughs> I, I believe it's, well, look around you, look at the support of the community, look at the um, innovative spirit, the diversity amongst us, um, the friendships. And, and I think one of the advantages we have of being small is that we are small. And so our neighbors are the politicians, the neighbors are our competitors. And we somehow have to juggle the those demands and you know it's not going to be a strong economy if there's only one manufacturing company left in a certain area we need the strength of everybody and and so i think that's what um, really speaks to north bay can i just conclude by saying that um, it has been our joy to have traveled all over this province to many many wonderful communities over the past eight years that the agenda has been on the air and for some reason we hadn't made it to north bay until today it's long overdue, but we are thrilled to be here. The hospitality has been fantastic. This is an extraordinary place that we've brought the program from today, and we're just grateful to everybody in North Bay and Canada College for making us feel so welcome. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon, and uh, it's been great. All the best, folks. Bye-bye. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.